forward to uh, this session as well on the subject of impartiality regulation. Is it still fit for purpose? I will just introduce the chair, Roger Bolton, who once again <coughs> scarcely needs any introduction. Um, long term, uh, obviously, presenter uh, on, uh, on Radio 4, but not just a presenter, he was uh, a long term editor of Panorama as well, and many other things in the BBC. And now, of course, presents his own podcast, Deep Watch, uh, which I commend to you. So I'll ask Roger to introduce the rest of the panel. Over to you, Roger. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the uh, free advertising. <laughs> Greatly appreciated. I am, of course, a totally impartial chair who has no views on anything. So uh, what we're going to try and do, uh, three things today. We're going to quickly have a discussion about what is, in principle, impartiality and whether it's desirable or not. Some people think that it's not. It's redundant as a concept. Secondly, we're going to hear from Ofcom about how they regulate uh, impartiality. And then thirdly, we're going to open it up to some concerns and criticisms uh, that people have of uh, what Ofcom is about to say. So that should be fun, and I hope that you'll uh, all contribute. Uh, and of course, I can't help uh, but uh, refer to some of the um, recent instances of our arguments or controversies about impartiality. Anyway, let's try to start with some definitions. Um, do, do people, you look it up and it says uh, in the dictionary or something, uh, impartiality, not partial or, or biased, treating or affecting all equally. And then, of course, there's a slight refinement on that, uh, which is due impartiality. Do you have to be impartial if a person says two and two equals five, do they have a right to broadcast next to someone who two and two equals four? Uh, let's just um, ask uh, to refine that definition of impartiality. And I'm joined by three people uh, who are uh, exceptionally well positioned to do so. On my far right is Professor Steve Barnett, who is Professor of Communications at the University of Westminster. And uh, not quite as old as I am, but he's always been at the forefront of the arguments for public service broadcasting. Next to me is Sue English, uh, the former head of political programs at the BBC, and she's now chair of the Disasters Emergency uh, Committee. Um, she has arm wrestled with more politicians than most. And then on my left is Adam Baxter, who's director of broadcasting standards at Ofcom. Uh, we should have had a fourth panelist, Ritha Shah, who was unfortunately unavoidably indisposed and is now getting better, fortunately. We would have loved to have her here, but that's just not been possible. Let's go back to these definitions of impartiality. Um, Sue, do you think there's any doubt about what it is in principle before we get to the awful problems of what it is in practice? Uh, well, I think there are various uh, definitions that people might come up with. Um, just before I go into that, I'd just like to say that uh, I was indeed the head of political programmes for BBC News for 10 years, but I left six years ago, so I'm no longer responsible for them. Um, and I have also, over the course of many years, because as you'll have noticed, this is a quite elderly panel, um, but in my many years in uh, broadcasting, I've worked for for all with virtually every major public service news broadcaster in the UK. So, you know, I would say that my definition of impartiality, and specifically due impartiality, is that it is absolutely the fundamental cornerstone of news in public service broadcasting in this country, and I think that's absolutely right. I would make no apology for that. It is difficult to do, um, and broadcasters don't always get it right. But just to be clear, being impartial or being duly impartial is not about being neutral or having a balanced view or indeed counting the number of minutes that you um, uh, allow for each side or however many sides of the argument there are. It is actually investigating doing the journalism behind the story, finding out what's happening, what are the facts, understanding the context in which you are reporting those facts, or indeed hosting a panel discussion about those facts, uh, contextualizing it, analyzing it, and then giving due weight to the different elements of the argument. Uh, and that's always the really difficult bit to calibrate, but that is what journalists do in broadcast newsrooms around the country every day of the year. And it is absolutely, you know, burnt into their DNA that fundamentally 
if they are going to deliver what um, Woodward and Bernstein described as the best obtainable version of the truth, that they have to do that within the bounds of due impartiality. Uh, and the one thing that I think I, I would absolutely stress at the moment is that, you know, we're surrounded by a plethora of information. I mean, we're swilling around in it. An awful lot of it is misinformation or disinformation. Uh, some of it quite deliberately so by various state actors. Uh, I've just come back from a visit to Taiwan, and if you could see how the public service broadcasters there are having to deal with the sort of misinformation that China pumps in every day, it is pretty shocking. Uh, and I just think at the moment, uh, we need to be really clear about the fact that the kind of impartiality that is baked into our broadcast news is absolutely critical for us as a society and as a democracy. But why, why now? Because some would argue, look, it's a bit like newspapers. There used to be a situation, there was only the BBC, ITV, Channel 4 and so on. It makes sense to regulate in those circumstances. Now you have so many organisations, there's a, there's a range of opinions available. Is it still as essential? Steve, how would you try and counter that argument and say it's still as relevant and important to regulate for impartiality as it ever was? I'd say look at America. Um, <clears throat> look at what happened when under Reagan in the 1980s they abandoned the fairness doctrine uh, which was the American version of impartiality um, in 1987. Nine years later uh, Rupert Murdoch sets up Fox News and I think you can draw a direct line from Fox News being set up in 96 to the insurrection uh, and the violence in, uh, on January the 6th, 2021. Uh, and the fact that 70%, 70% of Republican voters in the US still believe that the election in 2020 was stolen. Um, and that is a direct result of a very powerful single news channel being allowed essentially to broadcast what has become, um, I have to say, more than just a right-wing channel. It's become a far right-wing channel. Uh, and allowing white nationalists, supremacists, conspiracy theorists the opportunity to say more or less what they want without any kind of pushback. Um, so Can I just check that if, it were, if a BBC existed in the United States, would you be happy for Fox to continue in the way they did in the knowledge that there was an alternative? No, absolutely not. The point about, the point about broadcast journalists in this country, I mean, as Sue gave, I, I, that was an absolutely brilliant exposition, if I may say so, of what impartiality is. I would add one thing to what Sue said. It's not just news. It is current affairs. And, and I think this is, I mean, we'll come on to what Ofcom gets wrong in a minute, but the, 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 it is quite Can't clear, wait. Section 320 of the Communications Act says quite clearly that there are special impartiality requirements for programs that deal with matters of political or industrial controversy and matters relating to current public policy. So it's not just news, it's current affairs. And the fact is that in this country, people trust broadcast news. They trust the broadcasters. That trust has been hard earned. And it is a direct result of having impartiality requirements that lead to the kind of culture in the newsrooms that Sue was talking about. And that culture simply does not exist in newspapers uh, and in many online publishers. We have a very different print culture in this country. It's very different from the US. It's very different from most European countries. We have some brilliant journalists in, uh, in our print newsrooms. But as we are hearing now in the Mirror trial and uh, in the News Group trial and in the Mail trial, there are some pretty rogue journalists as well. The fact is, newspapers are free to say what they want. And that's right. That's as it should be. But the fact that we have these impositions on broadcasters in my view, they're not in positions, they're actually liberating, means that we have the kinds of culture in, in newsrooms that leads to the sort of, the, the integrity with which broadcast journalism is, is, is practiced. Just before we go further at this point, uh, because all of the panel, one way or another, are in favor of some form of regulation with relation to impartiality, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to argue that actually this is a, an outdated concept that we should now abandon this regulation. I'd be surprised if there is one, but I want anybody, but I just want to make sure that I didn't take, assume too much. 
Can we then just look at some of the areas then where it, where it get, is more difficult? I want to come, I'll, I'll ask you about Emily Maitlis and Gary Lineker in a moment. Uh, but I want to ask you about a, a subject that perhaps is not often debated, where it might be particularly difficult, and that is the Middle East. And where you know, if you report um, upon it, there are such powerful groups around that you'll be immediately attacked personally and there will be a long line of legal problems, in et cetera, and et cetera. And of course, there is a danger that in response to that, broadcasters uh, are impartial, not so much impartial, but begin to ignore or be afraid of going into certain areas because they're so heavily contested. Do you think that's the case with the Middle East too? Uh, no, I don't actually, Roger, agree with that. And, uh, you know, this goes back a very long time. I mean, I'm looking at my former Channel 4 News editor, Stuart Purvis, in the audience, and uh, he'll remember when I was at Channel 4 News, one of the main running stories in the 1980s was the Intifada. And we spend a lot of time and effort reporting on that. Um, today, I was listening to the news, and there's another Israeli incursion into Gaza. So, you know, that story has been running along for 40 years. And I think, on the whole... Um, television and radio news have covered it very fairly. Having said that, it is such an intense and difficult, in historical terms, in all sorts of terms, story to cover, that you will always find that people dislike the reporting that you've done. And it's not just one side that dislikes it, it's everybody involved. But it's and not just, I mean, it's not enough for people to say, this is what the Israelis say, this is what the Palestinians say. What you rely upon is due impartial, so uh, having reporters on the spot exactly. who can go in and say, actually, they said this, they said that, this is what happened. And I think that is the sort of impartial reporting you get. And I don't know whether anyone in the audience has been listening to Jeremy Bowen's fantastically good series. Yeah. He has a very interesting episode on reporting the Middle East uh, in which he talks to um, a BBC producer in Gaza and an Israeli journalist based in Tel Aviv. And it is absolutely fascinating because it completely, you know, underlines how difficult it is to report this unless you are on the spot. And being on the spot requires people who understand what's going on locally, which is why you need locally based producers, why you don't just parachute people in. But it also requires money and it requires a commitment to covering foreign news. And, you know, when you come down to it, impartiality in news coverage doesn't come cheap. And it doesn't matter whether it's domestic or foreign, you've got to be prepared to spend the money on good journalism on the ground. Adam, you want yeah, to go in? I just totally echo that. I mean, obviously, we see the vast range of uh, complaints come through uh, about this and other issues across the panoply of broadcasters uh, we license. And the PSBs in particular, but Sky, obviously, other... Um, uh, sort of reputable journalistic outfits are very good actually doing that very difficult analysis. I don't see any, I did a, don't detect any sort of self censorship, uh, quite the opposite actually, which is, I think, to be encouraged and to be welcomed. Uh, but can I just then jump on to the to two recent examples where impartiality has been uh, raised? One where I don't think it was a question of impartiality because Gary Lineker was clearly being partial. The question with Gary Lineker was whether he should have said what he said, not whether he was being impartial. His precise words uh, about uh, the government's plan to stop immigration, uh, this is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people um, in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 1930s. Now, nobody was going to say that's an impartial remark, so the only argument is whether he should have made it. I, 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 I don't have a problem with him in, well, I think there are two issues here. One is the, the general issue of to what extent impartiality guidelines should apply to non-news and current affairs um, presenters or journalists. Uh, and I am pretty clear in my mind that uh, the BBC needs to have available to it uh, popular presenters, popular talent, who are not going to sign anything to do with the BBC if they're being told you're gagged. You can't say anything about any controversial policy. I don't think that should apply to news. So I'm, I'm, I'm excluding news and current affairs presenters, journalists from that. 
but people like Gary Lineker, or I'd apply it to Alan Sugar, who's also, you know, in, in terms of what he was doing on The Apprentice and, and, and other popular presenters. I do think in that particular case, I do think that the, the specific wording of that tweet was perhaps unfortunate, particularly the reference to Germany. So, and I think that, that, that Gary Lineker possibly liked to kind of have a little poke and say, you know, I'm just testing the boundaries here. So, but I, I mean, I think any BBC guideline which prevents people like Lineker from saying what they want within reason uh, about controversial and difficult issues should be resisted. Stephen, are you sure? Because it's supposing sure. Gary Lineker said, I think the government absolutely right yeah. in its policy. It should be trying to stop migrants coming no, no, by I, water. I, I, you I, wouldn't have had a problem I with that. I absolutely would not have had a problem with that. And I've had precisely that argument with you know, people on the right of the spectrum. And, um, you know, when, if we get a more progressive government that brings in policies <coughs> that the right disagree with and a figure like you know, Jim Davidson, could you know stand up and say you know this is an appalling policy you know we ought, we ought to be cutting taxes or whatever I'm I trying don't have, I don't have a problem with that Sue I'm trying to read your face I can't on this I don't know whether you uh, <laughs> agree or you I, just think it's bonkers I completely disagree so, uh, right. sorry about that Steve but I think uh, there are very few people in the BBC but Gary Lineker is one of them who is so identified with the BBC and is so um, sorry I, he's identified with football he, yes but he's also identified with the BBC and I'm afraid I think it was absolutely clear I think it's clear in the current guidelines I know they're rewriting them but I think it is clear in the current guidelines that his tweet on a matter of such public controversy was out of order uh, and I don't think he should have done it the, there's a, another point that I would just raise here which is that uh, I think the BBC was hamstrung in the way that it dealt with that because of the controversy around its uh, chairman. I agree. Because actually, on something as important as that, the chairman should be out there fronting up for the BBC, and he was unable to do it because of the uh, controversy that he was facing. And I think it was a really good example of why, in BBC governance terms, in basic governance terms, you have to have a chairman who is seen to be impartial so that they can front up for the BBC on something like yeah, that. I think that's but, I, but I fundamentally think that Gary Lineker was wrong and I think the BBC should have stuck to their guns and said... Right, I don't, I don't want to go any further. I just, no, I just want to make clear where your positions are because we're going to get to more substantive things. But I want to also ask you another You're quotation. Stop the BBC from a lot of popular talent. Right, okay. Not, not that, let, this is about, uh, okay, let's continue. Let's put, me, put the Emily Maitlis question to you, because she was a current affairs presenter. Well, news magazine, current affairs, however you want to put it, she could call her a news presenter. And the famous thing she said in May 2020, um, uh, uh, during COVID and uh, after some excursions to the north of England by certain people, she said, Dominic Cummings, this is pre-title, setting up the programme, Dominic Cummings broke the rules, the country can see that, and it shocked the government cannot. Now, presumably, Steve, if that is a statement of fact, there's nothing wrong with it. But is it a statement of a fact? No, it's bang to rights. Completely wrong. And I watched it. She live. should not have done it. No, I watched it live at the time, and I said to my wife, "That's out of order, and there's going to be a major fuss about that." It's, it was wrong. I completely agree, happy to say. Um, I think uh, it's, it's the sort of thing that you can say in a, a newspaper column, yeah. absolutely fine, it's an opinion, um, fine. It's not something that you should be saying at the top of a news programme. Yeah. And I think, you know, just, just to be clear about this, you know, there are a lot of very, very good journalists in the BBC. I think Emily was one of them, and I work very closely with her on election coverage, and I've got a lot of uh, respect for her. But if you get to the point in the BBC where you no longer believe that you don't have the right to have opinions that you broadcast on your programmes, and it's time for you to move on. And I think she did absolutely the right thing by going to somewhere where the regulations are such, and I'm sure Adam will explain to us why that is the case, that you can have opinion. But in this instance, absolutely bang to It's a great rights. shame that Lewis Goodall went as well. Though. Well, we can well, have a conversation. Right, about OK, that. now let's get down and have a little skirmish around the territory to look at the question of, of, of the regulation uh, as it applies to the moment. And we're delighted to have Adam Baxter, Director of Broadcast Standards of Ofcom, who this week has just ruled against GB News on this very yes. issue. Just to, just to explain, before you start, if you would, yeah, sure. explain what you decided and why. 
Yes, yeah, so just to um, people who haven't had the time or the inclination to read our, our latest decision, um, uh, this was the second decision we published in relation to Mark Stein, uh, who people might know as the uh, well-known Canadian polemicist and commentator, who, who did have a show, um, which went on several times a week, on GB News. Very punchy, spiky uh, uh, presenter. He would often have very similarly spiky and uh, sort of uh, opinionated guests on his show. We had um, two investigations. One, we, we published a decision, I think it was back in March, where we recorded a breach of our material misleadingness rule because he, uh, in this particular program, had focused on a, a statistical survey um, published by um, one of the medical health agencies in the UK. And he was very keen to say, oh, look, I've got the actual tables up, the actual numbers, look, you show, I'm not, I'm not just summarising this, it's the actual data. And he was making a point about the efficacy, or, or in his view, the threat, the, the third uh, vaccine, the booster vaccine, um, and its effect on death rates, um, which he's totally entitled to do. But the trouble is, he missed out in very, very important context. For instance, in that survey, um, it, had, it was covered in disclaimers saying, do not read into this survey, these survey results, any efficacy of the, of the, the third vaccine. And also, importantly, he, his interpretation of the data um, made a sort of a basic factual statistical error in terms of um, his interpretation because he totally neglected to mention, of course, the death rate will be influenced by the fact that the vast majority of people who've had the third vaccine are in the older uh, cohort society. So clearly they're going to be dying of a whole host of things. So we recorded that breach. And then the, the second decision, which Naomi, is Naomi named, Wolf. Naomi yes. Wolf. Slightly different, well, the same in the sense it was about the broad area of COVID, but she wasn't, it wasn't discussing a statistical report. She was on saying some really quite inflammatory views, her views, about uh, COVID. And once again, and maybe we can come on to this, there's nothing under our broadcasting code which prohibits any topic or issue being covered as such in of itself. But if broadcasts do this, they've got to make sure that they've got sufficient context and protections around that content. Now, in this this case, she was saying some very incendiary stuff. So, like, um, COVID is designed mass murder um, by governments and things of that ilk. And Mr. Stein um, made no attempt to challenge her or critique her or rebut what she was saying. Indeed, was if anything could be seen to be sort of largely sort of supporting her. So, we recorded a breach of our rule. Um, which requires broadcasters to ensure that if they have potentially harmful content, and I think, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, if not everybody, would agree those statements by Naomi Wolf were potentially harmful, you can do that, but once again, you've got to, it's the context. What, what protections are you providing for the audience? So if... Do that, you mean if you had somebody else there, she could still have said, this is mass murder, if there was somebody yeah, no, informed well, well, there who would say not, are you happy well, for that? Well, it depends. There's, there's, there's a, it's down to the, the, the broadcaster. We are... Deliberately, you know, we don't prescribe the, the correct editorial technique to use in any particular case. But that's an example. Or he, as the presenter, could have said, well, you know, could have just challenged her, rebutted her, contextualised it, said, look, what you're saying is incredibly controversial. X, Y, and Z say you are talking conspiracy theory, hokum, or whatever. But he made no attempt to do that. And when, when uh, you told GB News this, um did they attempt to defend it, or did they say, oh, God, we've made a mistake, that's it, sorry, it won't well, happen again? Well, I mean, obviously, if you read the decision, it's a long-ish decision, and we, as with all our decisions, we summarise the response, because um, as part of our processes, our procedures, we give the broadcaster, any time we investigate, two chances to make representation. So we ask their initial views, we basically draft what we call a preliminary view, a sort of draft decision, if you will. We send that to them, and then they have a second opportunity to make reps. And they were making various arguments. So I, I, I don't want to just give But they didn't come with their hands yeah, up, yeah, did yeah. they? Well, I think their latest statement said that they accepted um, Ofcom's uh, ruling, although they, they were had some queries about, um, and I don't want to paraphrase here or misrepresent them, but uh, they had some comments on about their views about the, the regulatory regime. I can imagine. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Would no, you like? Sorry, to... sorry. Just a uh, just a little coda to that is that 
uh, because we've had these two breaches, we've actually, uh, on, and on the face of the second decision, we've said we're inviting them in for a compliance meeting so to discuss their compliance in this area. So, I mean, clearly Mr. Stein is no longer uh, engaged by them, but... Um, no, he uh, left because I think he thought it was, he was going to have to pay any damages that were... Uh, uh, I, levied against I his have program. no particular insights on that. I've, I read the right. same articles as you do. I, if they're to be believed, uh, allegedly or apparently, he was being asked to uh, accept a contractual obligation that uh, he would be uh, liable for any Ofcom financial penalties. I mean, I mean, I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, I should stress that um, uh, in these cases we haven't imposed, and will, nor will we be posing a financial penalty. Why not? Because um, we... Oh, this is egregious. This is pretty dramatic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Alleging mass murder. So, and you don't think it's worth a penalty? Well, I'll just explain. So under the Communications Act, um, we obviously have our uh, the duties to enforce broadcast standards, as says out in the Broadcasting Code. And the, in the vast majority of cases, if we do investigate and we re record a breach... We find a broadcaster has recorded a breach. That is a matter of public record on their compliance record. We publish it in our broadcast bulletin. And then um, we also ask ourselves the question, well, is a breach serious? Is it reckless? Is it deliberate? Is it repeated? Now, I mean, I'm not expecting everybody to agree with us on this, but our decision in this case was that the, the second breach had not reached that bar. Now, clearly, um, we're... We'll be seeing if in future GB News behaves itself and whether we open any other such investigations. And then obviously we look at all the evidence open to us uh, in assessing their compliance record. But in this case, uh, in answer to your question, we didn't think it, it, it got to that bar. Please continue, sir. I've interrupted you enough. No, no, fine. So do, because I'm aware of, of death by PowerPoint, I've just got about five or six slides. And this is such a complex area as... as um, we've already touched upon. So I can only, you know, just skim the surface, but I just wanted to give a few little, uh, a bit of a flavour of, of the rules, our approach, and just a couple of issues which I'm, I'm sure Steve and Sue might want to be coming on to anyway. So just the legal background, um, we, we've touched on this. So news, uh, under the Communications Act 2003, news has to be duly impartial and duly accurate. And Steve was alluding to this, but obviously we're not talking just about news. Because if outside of news, if you're dealing with matters of political controversy, matters of current public policy, that has to comply with uh, the special impartiality uh, rules or requirements that Steve was alluding to. There's no requirement on due accuracy outside of news. Um, however, we do have this rule, this material misleading this rule, um, which I was referring to um, a moment ago. Of course, um, what fascinates me about this debate um, is that, quite rightly, we're talking about the obligation of due impartiality. UK broadcasting has a rich history. It's, it's very much in its DNA, as Sue was indicating. Due impartiality is incredibly important, and the PSBs, as we know, find incredibly important. Um, we don't hear a lot about another side of it, which is freedom of expression, because we as a public body have to be keenly aware that we every decision, every intervention we make has to take into account freedom of expression. Um, Article 10 of the ECHR is reflected in the 1998 Human Rights Act. I mean, those, that lays out on this slide the sort of the, the parameters of freedom of expression, but it's something that we, in every case we're assessing, we are constantly asking ourselves. And I know that can be frustrating to some people because they'll say, well, hang on a minute, this is, this is absolutely appalling or something is terrible. Yes, it, it may be, but as part of the process, we've got to just ask ourselves, well, was something said... In the con could we give it sufficient leeway uh, in the context of freedom of expression? And this is difficult. It's, it's not easy. And look, we're, there are about, what, 50 or 60 people in this room, and we are all very passionate about broadcasting, I would like to think. And it's, it, you know, we are, it, it would be very difficult to get unanimity on all cases when we're talking about matter around due impartiality. So I'm not saying, you know, feel sorry for the regulator. I'm just saying... Please appreciate these. These are very difficult, uh, often on the balance issues, and we give it huge amounts of consideration in Ofcom. Um, and maybe we can sort of discuss the process a bit more in due course. And then the, you discussed uh, or asked earlier about the definition of due impartiality. And I, I thought Sue's uh, uh, analysis or, or stab uh, was really good. And actually, 
if you look at the definition, this is, comes from the broadcasting code, so broadly picks out some of the points you were saying. So what does due impartiality mean? Well, it means not favouring one side over the other, but due is really important. We're not there talking about absolute impartiality. We're talking about due. It's, it, it's uh, there to give flexibility um, and editorial freedom to broadcasters because, um, you know, there are a range of... Um, editorial scenarios, range of stories, range of issues that have been covered, and you're not necessarily going to have the same approach to due impartiality in each case. As Sue said, we're, we're not there with stopwatches in Ofcom Towers um, measuring what each side gets. It's a very much a holistic um, view in each case, looking very forensically carefully at the content of each programme, or in a series of link programmes, editorial link programmes, if, that, if that's relevant. And context is really important. So the, the approach to impartiality will not be the same, say, in a satirical Friday Night comedy show, mentioning no candidates, to a so clearly a top-of-the-hour news bulletin. Um, so, I mean, I suppose that's fairly obvious, but I think it's really important to keep mentioning these sort of issues, the facts of, of context. Just at the bottom there, just mention another feature of the, the provision in the Act, which Steve was uh, quoting from earlier. There are greater obligations when dealing with so-called matters of major political industrial controversy, major matters relating to current public policy. So what do I mean by that? Well, those are really matters of up-to-date and really important uh, national or inter international importance. I mean, a key example, like obviously during an election period, that is automatically a major matter. So we expect broadcasters, understandably, to go that much further. So, I mean, that's a really quick, high-level scamper through some of the key issues. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of things which might come up and just mindful of the sort of interests of what I know are a very interested um, group Sorry, of people. Uh, so on the BBC, um, I won't talk about the BBC First complaints process because we could have a whole afternoon, a whole day on that. On BBC impartiality, um, I'm fascinated by this debate because... We, we see a lot from commentators, politicians, talking about the BBC's impartiality. And indeed, as we know, um, Tim Davey launched this, uh, the 10-point uh, action plan, impartiality editorial standards action plan. Um, but I think, going back once again to the, the statutory definition of what we are required uh, to enforce in terms of BBC content, we're there to enforce due impartiality. Um, and I think, um, on, when looking at the BBC First system, Another criticism we get is that, oh, Ofcom, why don't you launch lots and lots of investigations about the BBC? But it forgets how that criticism forgets the fact that we are just one aspect, one part of the BBC First process, like the apex, if you will. So the BBC uh, Executive Complaints Unit is reaching a lot of decisions each year uh, where it is deciding on matters relating to due impartiality under the editorial guidelines of the BBC, which broadly reflect the broadcasting code. And I just put there just to say that uh, in the first five years of the Charter, the BBC ECU uh, upheld or partially upheld impartiality cases in 25 instances. So we are not for matters of resource and prioritisation because, you know, I have limited resources. I can't, you know, ideally like to do lots of stuff, but it would not be proportionate for us to launch endless numbers of investigations where we simply replicated the BBC ECU decision. No, you, you are a sort of course of appeal in some ways. And yes. if you think there's a major test issue, you would intervene. Oh, absolutely, and we have done. And we have right. done. Yep. So if the ECU has breached a, reached a breach of its guidelines, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, well, if we think it, well, it's a breach. We're not, if it's fairly a straightforward matter. Now, there have been honourable examples. So um, the BBC bus case in Oxford Street, that's, I mean, that's quite a notable... Uh, that, that's the case where it was a BBC report suggested that anti-Semitic remarks had been made from inside a bus where yeah. there was some Jewish and figures. And that was a massive... That issue. was challenged because it was said that was not the case. Uh, it had caused a great deal of problem in the Jewish community and there were demands for the BBC to apologise and so on. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we clearly did an investigation there. But um, so... And then also on, uh, another tool we use is that uh, once again, being proportional, and going back to the Emily Maitlis case we were talking, to, uh, talking about a moment ago, where we think, it, you know, we haven't got much to add in terms of investigation, but there's value if we come out with our reasoning about why we are not opening that investigation. For instance, if we have some important guidance to give to the BBC, as we did in that case, we will write up what that so-called not pursued um, decision to say, OK, we're not pursuing it because, in that case, the ECU found 
and make this a bridge. But we wanted to just re to emphasise to BBC and all broadcasters the care that news news presenters must take in you know to seem to stray into sort of um, giving their own personal opinions. Just scampering on uh, BBC Mid Charter Review, I think just on this slide and please read the rest at your leisure. I think. Going back to this debate about the BBC's impartiality, we did some extensive research about audience perceptions of the BBC's impartiality, and we found that actually what people were citing a lot of broad concerns about BBC's impartiality, but when you'd asked them in the focus groups, it wasn't about individual bits of content. It was tended to be driven by a range of other factors. So it could be things like um, the presenters on screen, you know, the tone of their voice, the, the What's been said in the media, importantly, the, the criticisms of the BBC, which we were uh, you know, discussing earlier this morning. So there were a lot of non-programming, non-content factors which were driving, driving those perceptions. And of course, the Sorota Review and the Action Plan I mentioned, we've been challenging the BBC to say, look, you've got to tackle these perceptions because you, in general, got a pretty good um, compliance record under the impartiality regime. So, but you, you have this mismatch of perceptions. Last slide, I promise. Politicians and presenters. Now, there's a, a limit to what I can say, and this might be frustrating to uh, my fellow panellists, I don't know, or people in the room, but because we've got um, at least one live investigation on this issue, I, I will be, have to be quite cute, and, and I won't be able to perhaps be as fulsome as I could be. So please uh, be understanding on that. What I have just tr tried to lay out here is what our present regime is in terms of these rules. So obviously, during elections, if you're a candidate, um, you can't be a presenter of any sort of programme. At any time, you cannot be a presenter of a news programme. But our rules um, say that if you are a politician, uh, you can present uh, programmes outside of news, as long as you're not a, a candidate. So uh, what is a new what programme? What is a current affairs programme? And Steve has probably given a so the indication he might well disagree with where we are, which is fine, I, re I respect that. It is incredibly challenging, I think, nowadays, where even since where the Broadcaster Code Fest came in in 2005 to now, and I, and I see people in the audience, uh, such as Tim, who were around when that, the, the, the Code first came in, arguably life was perhaps a bit simpler in terms of what we, when we were saying, oh, what is a news format, what is a current affairs format? Like all things, there's innovation, there's dynamism in the broadcasting market, which has probably made it much more challenging. And we're having to focus on that and deal with that in this, in this actual uh, investigation we're doing at the moment. I mean, I'm really fascinated. If, if people have views, I'm sure they have on this. I'm, I'm here to listen. Well, I, but anyway, but that's it. Right, don't, don't move. Thank okay. you very much. Stand there. Otherwise, the right. people here won't be able to see you. Yeah. But hold on. Right. Let, there are two areas here, really, I suppose we're talking about. There's the limitations, possibly, of the Communications Act, and there are questions about the Ofcom guidance. Now, Steve, you've got a particular concern, I think, haven't you, about the definition of news? Well, I, I don't really... I, 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 I think Ofcom are making life far more complicated for themselves than they need to. I mean, the fact is, we're talking about matters of political and industrial uh, controversy. That's, that's what the Act says. Uh, there, is, there is no need to differentiate between news programmes and current affairs programmes. And as far as I'm concerned, GB News and Talk TV are full of um, uh, uh, presenters, uh, contributors' uh, views, which are all addressing matters of political industrial controversy. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a bulletin that's running at, from eight o'clock to five past eight, or whether it's a news program presented by Dan Wooten uh, or Piers Morgan, which is running for an hour or two hours. The fact is, they are addressing major political issues. I don't we can put about the word major. And it seems to me that Ofcom is simply not applying its statutory role as a regulator of impartiality to those channels. It's dodging that bullet and it's doing so with frankly, and I'm not, this is not addressed to Adam, absolutely not, with some pretty disingenuous uses of language around differentiating between different kinds of news and current affairs. That is not what the statute says. This is Ofcom's interpretation. The two, ver the two judgments that we've heard about are not about impartiality. They're about accuracy and uh, harm to public health, fine. I'm asking what about harm to democracy, and that's my problem.
Well, it, it, this, as I understand it from this brilliant briefing note, which I hope I understand from the VLV, <laughs> it says that one of the problems is the definition of news is unclear in the Communications Act, which it believes this is at the root of the problem. It says in this section, news means news in whatever form it's included in a service. And the recommendation of a number of people is that the definition of news needs to be challenged, Ofcom's definition. It needs to include weekly news discussion programs as well as daily news magazine programs. And why are they treated differently? Why do you treat them differently? Right, okay, there's some interesting points there. Um, I, I, I obviously, once again, I, do, I don't want to sound evasive here because <laughs> I've got to be quite careful what I'm saying because of, of, a, of a live investigation. Just a couple of comments. I suppose one must remember this, these rules have existed for, for a long time. Indeed, the, the, the rule about presenters or politicians as presenters, there was basically virtually identical rule in the ITC programming code that predated Ofcom. Now, um, which what it says is no politician may be used as a newsreader, interviewer yeah. or reporter in any news programmes unless exceptionally it is yeah. editorially mm -hmm. justified. Well, you've got two presenters who were, um, one of whom was a member of the government a very short while ago, both Conservative MPs, presenting what can certainly be described as a news magazine programme. I can't say, honestly, I'm, I'm so sorry, I cannot... But you can say what you see, I mean, it's a fact. They are... I'm not, I'm sorry, members. I'm sorry, I can't... Can we establish? They are, they are, I'm four, they are be, present I'm not members. Get into a, I'm not going to, I'm no, sorry. The facts, the facts. They are <laughs> two Tory members, and one of them has just come out of the cabinet not long ago. Is that true or not? I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into a, a running commentary. Is on it true they are, are I'm, presenting I'm, I'm, a magazine no, program? Peter, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you must respect the fact that I've got an open yeah. investigation at the moment. And I do not want to do anything that sort yeah. of could be seen as undermining that due and fair process. But how much does but this... It's not, I'm sorry, it's not even about presenters. I mean, yeah. it is actually much broader than that. You know, I don't have a problem necessarily with Dan Wooten presenting a programme. But when he's talking about the BBC licence fee, and this is supposed to be a programme that is governed by impartiality rules, the way the BBC is funded is actually a major political issue. And all you get from Wooten and his guests is it's an outrage, it's insidious, it should be abandoned, it should be abolished. And every now and then he persuades someone, I've always refused, but he persuades someone to go on who is going to try and defend the license fee and they just get mocked and laughed at and rebuked. That is not an impartial approach to a matter of major political controversy. And Ofcom sits on its hands. And I, again, I'm sorry, Adam, it's not personal. I'm, but I'm you not have not, there has not, not been a single, a single issue on impartiality which Ofcom has taken up, and it's staring you in the face every minute of the day. And it's really about time that Ofcom uh, did something about its statutory duty to monitor impartiality and pass judgment, because we've seen what happens in America. In the end, it's dangerous for democracy. Uh, and can I just ask, are you, are you saying that, in your view, Ofcom has the power to act, or that the act itself is flawed in its definitions, which make it difficult for Ofcom to act. Ofcom absolutely has the power to act, but I think it's being disingenuous in the way it's interpreting the act, in, and frankly, almost interpreting its own code. Because, you know, it, 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 its own code allow, would allow it much more flexibility to come down on those kinds of programs that are quite clearly propagandist partisan and one-sided, but it chooses not to. Can um, you respond without specific reference to yeah, no, Esther, Esther McVeigh? Okay. Well, no, no, absolutely. I mean, we have received a large number of complaints about GB News, as we're, we're so getting on. I didn't want to name individual services, but clearly uh, this is uh, something of interest. And we, like I say, the team, my team, carefully looks at all parts of a programme, all aspects of it, and asks themselves the question, well, clearly there are certain statements, say they're critical of the, the, the licence fee, say. And, but we ask ourselves, well, what alternative viewpoints in there, what other context, which, uh, and taking into account freedom of expression, um, does that get us over the line? And one key thing to remember here is audience expectations. The audience expectations of GB News, which is a self-styled, self-describing disruptor, uh, <laughs> 
focusing in a certain sort of um, agenda will not be identical to a PSB audience. So in terms of our application of the June partiality rules, we have to take into account context. Um, and therefore, we are not taking an identical approach to, say, uh, a BBC One current affairs programme to what, you know, some of the output on GB News. Huh? Now, so, so, and get, sorry, can I just, just sorry. before Steve comes back. Sure. I mean, so, a lot of these cases, they are obviously, I'm not, I'm not pretending otherwise, they are pushing the envelope. That's, that is what they're there to do. But in a way that they've got the creative and editorial freedom to do that, like any broadcaster has. And we're not there to be perfectionist. We're not saying, oh, well, it would have been best if they'd done that, or they, they could have done this. We're having to be very um, impartial ourselves and ask ourselves, was there sufficient in each individual programming, a bit of programming, that satisfies us that they were the right side of the line, even if it's on balance and right up to the line? And like I say, we haven't identified any issues today. And I, and I totally appreciate, Steve, where you come from. You get, and people in this room will have a different uh, position. But, you know, we are operating as the uh, independent regulator created by Parliament, where we are existing um, in, in the context of our statutory duties and balancing concepts such as freedom of expression. Can I just come back on yeah. one issue? I mean, it, it, it's, you're almost saying and this is the argument of Fox News, that because the audience for Fox News is basically right-wing and conspiracy theorists, the fact that we have a channel which uh, caters for um, white supremacists and conspiracy theorists, we ought to take that into account and therefore allow them their white supremacist conspiracy theories as, because that's part of the context for due impartiality. And I, I, I just, I, I, first of all, I find that extraordinary. And second of all, I repeat, you are not abiding by your statutory duty. I'm going to say one more thing on freedom. So just pick up Sorry, that. Okay. I'll come back to you. I promise to you. But on this, um, your code says, I think, that hmm. the likely expectation of the audience should be taken into account when assessing whether a program is duly impartial. Hmm. And that raises the question of how do you know what the expectation of the audience is? And, uh, and picking up Steve's point, um, does it mean that you know, if, you, if you think or have found a way of establishing the audience was particularly left or right wing, mm. they can almost abandon any attempt to represent alternative saying, views? I'm not saying well, What does it mean then? The likely expectation of the audience should be taken into we, account. We undertake research, which uh, not just in impartiality, but looking at all aspects of our regulation, where we're actually, because we don't want to be, you know, sort of making things up, will be accused of making things up. We are, are keenly aware that we need to reflect the views of audiences and actually try and sort of calibrate our regulation in the most appropriate and sensitive way so that, uh, so that we are affording broadcasters, all broadcasters, the editorial freedom, the creative freedom to make programming as long as they stay the right side of the line. So that is key for us to understanding uh, the expectation of audience. I mean, Steve said, characterizes the, the audience of uh, GV News. I'm not, I'm not going to get into a sort of debate about exactly what the, the average viewer is like, but there's no doubt that in looking at the programming they said that they wanted to put on prior to launch and since launch, um, that they are covering issues which maybe um, a lot of people don't want to talk about or they don't want to, be, um, to have discussions about. Now, that's totally fine. We, they've got the creative freedom, the editorial freedom to do that, but in mind their Article 10 rights under the ECHR, as long as they are duly impartial. Now, I... But isn't there, no, is but there a problem here? I, Sorry, if I may say, yeah. isn't there a problem here, which is there's partiality in the treatment uh, of... Uh, impartiality in the way you treat a subject, mm. but the very selection of yeah. the subject itself and the non-selection of something else mm. can demonstrate partiality. I think that's a slightly different matter in the sense that what we're reflecting our statutory duties. Now, clearly... Uh, you mean when, you when don't think the agenda, you don't think, it, well, let's I mean, say a left-wing agenda, a right-wing agenda, that's fine as long as they're impartial in the way they treat that well, agenda. Well, let, let me just answer the question. I mean, I'm acutely aware of what the statutory duties that we are operating under. I'm not given by Parliament, and I'm not saying I should have it or ask it, it's not a matter for me, it's ultimately a matter for government and then Parliament, about, uh, to, to actually 
prescribe or have a perfectionist view about what broadcasters, and I'm going outside the PSB ecology, because obviously PSB, there are different arguments about key genres that people, the, those organisations should be focusing on. But getting outside PSB, um, it is, the legislation does not set a duty on Ofcom to, to in some way prescribe or say, oh, well, there are certain issues you should be covering or there are certain issues you shouldn't be covering. We have a high-level general principle, flexible, I hope, code, reflecting the broad, those broad, similarly quite broad brush statutory principles, which say, okay, broadcasters, if you want to cover these issues, you're free to do so, but you must do so in a way that stays the right side of the line. Now, if you don't, as we've, you, we're talking about those two breaches not Stein, then we are very happy and we will urgently and as speedily as possible record breaches of our rules. Can I come back to Steve, a brief point, and then I want to come to Sue. Right? I wanted to pick up this freedom of expression point because it's increasingly being used by Ofcom. And we would all obviously stand by Article 10 um, uh, and, and the importance of Article 10 and, and, and the right of all of us and publishers to freedom of expression. Um, but I just want to give you a quote from Dame Melanie Dawes in her uh, evidence to the Select Committee. She said, we're always thinking... She's the, sorry, permanent... Sorry. sorry. No, no, Melanie Dawes is the Ma chief executive. She's the chief executive. Sorry, chief executive of... Sorry, chief executive of yes, was permanent secretary, now chief executive yeah, of Ofcom. Of Ofcom. Yeah. And in her evidence to the Select Committee, she, the DCMS Select Committee, she said, we're always thinking about freedom of expression, do, and we do not want to see just a single monocultural, a mono-representation of views on British TV. When you compare what you get in the UK with what you see in America, which is unregulated, it's very, very different. Now, the notion that impartiality imposes some kind of monocultural, monorepresentative view of the UK is, first of all, factually incorrect, but second of all, and worryingly, is very reminiscent of this sort of culture wars, culture warrior narrative, which is increasingly coming from the right. And, I want to, I mean, I was going to do this at the end, but if Roger will let me, I'm, I'm just going to quote very briefly from a court of appeal judgment, because this is ironic. This was Ofcom being taken to court by RT mm -hmm. in 2020. That's the RT, Russian, the Russian sorry, state. Russia, Russia today, what yeah. used to be Russia today. And um, the, the court actually upheld Ofcom's right to judge, adjudicate on impartiality by saying, and, and rejected RT's appeal, mm -hmm. by saying that permitting a provider of television services to avoid the requirement of due impartiality, even for one program, would severely harm the quality of political discourse in this country, and in doing so, would seriously harm the rights of others as protected by Article 10. So there is a freedom of expression argument within the impartiality regulations Absolutely, as that. decided by the Court of Appeal. And I do, it really worries me that Ofcom is starting to, to, to sort of take on this narrative of impartiality meaning a mono representation versus allowing a thousand flowers to bloom, including the conspiracy theorists and the white supremacists. Um, Would you like to come well, back on that? Well, thanks. I mean, perhaps surprising, unsurprisingly, I take a different view. I totally agree and endorse what the the, uh, the Court of Appeal judge said there. And this is what I've been trying to say, freedom of expression does run through due impartiality. That's the whole point. And, and going on to Melanie's comment, I think from memory, and I haven't got the, the, the text in front of me, but I think it might also be, be neat, uh, important to reflect that she, at that time in the, the committee hearing, she had been asked about our new online safety duties as well. So there's freedom of expression is just not being uh, talked about and she was not talking about in that context, I believe, in the context of the uh, regulated broadcast space, but also our new duties under the Online Safety Bill. And we, will, we are going to be required to take into account freedom of expression. I, I personally, from where I see, I was, you know, the thousands, uh, tens of thousands of complaints each year, we see a very diverse, rich broadcasting sector and people making vast amounts of programmes, some good, some not so good. Um, um, about a whole range of issues and brilliant long may it long may it last i'm not there to sort of come down once again as, a, as, as with a sort of perfectionist view of some monocultural approach nor should i that'd be appalling so i, I think i agree with you on that steve 
Can we have one, two questions? So forgive me um, for not giving you more time. Patrick. Uh, Paddy Bauer, it's a very interesting discussion. I'm, I'm basically with Steve on this, but uh, I've got a sort of related issue, something which I've been sort of confused about for some time, and that is to do with uh, the journalists leaving the BBC mm. uh, to work for other broadcasters as opposed to doing commercial podcasts, which are clearly outside yeah, yeah. all of this. Um, and there are several reasons someone might want to leave the BBC, they'll get more money, they won't have what they're paid published once a year and discussed in the, in the Daily Mail and so on. However, what they have all said is they will have more freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding is that the, the broadcasting code, the due impartiality, applies to all broadcasters. Mm -hmm. So is Andrew Marr wrong in thinking he, he should have, he'll have more freedom outside the BBC oh. or is is it that sort of all animals are equal, but the BBC is a little bit more equal than the others? Just to correct you, I mean, you know, you asked the question for clarification. Um, yeah. Our code um, does not allow um, news presenters and uh, reporters to provide their personal viewpoints on matters of political controversy, current public policy, hence the, the endless mateless issue we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Our code does permit presenters outside of news to, to have uh, opinions, very strong opinions, if they wish, um, on, on such matters, as long as due impartiality is still being preserved. And the way that you preserve due impartiality is a matter for the broadcaster. And there are a lot of editorial so, so techniques. It, it, therefore, done. could Andrew Marr have had as much freedom if he'd stopped being associated with news programmes but stayed within the BBC? But now I think you might be, um, and I don't know whether there's any colleagues from the BBC uh, here today, but there's also a point about you're, you're coming into sort of almost a, a brand brand um, identification and rules that a broadcaster might place on its own news and current affairs staff. So are you saying that the, the constraints which he has been operating under in the BBC are internal constraints? I, I wouldn't like to comment because I don't know, I haven't spoken to Andrew Marr, so I, I mean, wouldn't... I the, the chair or, or either of the other panellists? Well... Because um, this is confusing for me. I, don't, I genuinely don't know enough about the, yeah. the specific case, but um, I, I think it is clear that uh, it would not be possible, if you were Andrew Marr, to express your opinions when you're presenting the Andy Marr, Andrew Marr show on BBC One on a Sunday morning. Um, now, you can interpret that in any way you like, and you can look at what he's doing on LBC and say, well, why doesn't that fall within the same... Exactly. Mm. And, 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 and genuinely, I don't understand either. But I think it's a BBC. It's a BBC decision, isn't it? It, it basically. No, it's not us. And it's also it's <laughs> next time Andy Marr, having expressed his view pro or against the government uh, and identifying himself with the political part or a view, his own view on an issue, interviews the prime minister. The first thing the prime minister will do when the race, when the question is raised, saying, "Well, I know what you think, Andrew." And the perception of the independence of Andrew Marr in the eyes of the audience will have been blown. Uh, so whether it's strictly impartiality as understood by Ofcom or not, it's in terms of the perception of the audience of Andrew Marr's position. And that's what the BBC fights for. Back to Stephen, uh, sorry, my pick your part, Stuart, Stuart Purvis. Yes, I'm uh, Stuart Purvis, formerly ITN and Ofcom. Uh, Adam, let me put it to you this way. <laughs> people who worked in broadcasting for many years or people who worked in broadcast regulation for many years used to think the system was that if you had a highly opinionated presenter mm. talking almost every day of the week with a particular political viewpoint about issues of the day, mm. then you would either need to make sure that there was within that program a significant voice expressing a different point of view yeah. Or you would have other programs in which people of a different persuasion could present in a similar style but from a different viewpoint. What you now appear to be saying is that the, the way that the alternative views are expressed are a matter for the broadcaster. So if the broadcaster decides that having had a discussion between people right. of the same point of view, somebody will pop up, either who is actually an impartial journalist and expressing an impartial view, but not a contrary view, or that somebody who, frankly, is not a significant uh, advocate either way in this argument, that that counts as an alternative view. 
Well, first of all, um, and hello again, Stuart. Stuart used to be my boss many years ago, Ofcom. Um, uh, no, well, basically, we're not, we're not changing, we're not doing anything new. It has always been the case, as far as Ofcom's concerned, and you can read our guidance, which has been there for, for years, is that there are a range of editorial techniques by which you can achieve due impartiality. Now, one that is commonly used, you can have person A, person B, and a moderator or a chairman, and, and that's a fairly obvious, quite you know, straightforward way of achieving due impartiality. But of course, a lot of broadcasters might not be able to get hold of a particular representative of an organisation or an individual, but they still want to cover that matter. So we, to get round the concept of a, you know, somebody somehow vetoing a programme going ahead, we said, well, there are other techniques. Maybe there's recorded clips of that person speaking or that organisation, that political party. You could have a journalist, or say like a political journalist coming on, representing the missing point of view. You could have a, if it was just a presenter with a interviewee, and this is, I suppose, a bit what Sir Mark Stein didn't do in his case with Naomi Wolf. You could be robustly challenging, critiquing, probing, putting the criticisms of, that are against that person to that person. So we are, and we're deliberately here not to prescribe and set out, oh, there is one set way you've got to do it in all circumstances. Stuart, can I just ask, just ask briefly on Stuart, if you were his boss, would you tell him he's wrong, or would you say <laughs> the administration which is now implementing the law is far more liberal than the one you did? Well, my interpretation of their interpretation <laughs> is, number one, the lawyers at Ofcom are very, very worried about Article 10 and are worried about losing in court. Number two, that there is a wish in the government to broaden the range of broadcasters in the country. And that, those are the two factors, I think, which are really the background to all this. And effectively, there has been a reinterpretation of the rules about alternative views, but Ofcom has not been open about that. It has not said, in the light of a number of developments, we have decided that from now on this, they have basically, by fiddling around with this business about news and current affairs, forget, I agree with, with you know, forget about news and current affairs. If it's a political discussion about issues of the day, it's a political discussion about issues of the day. And it doesn't matter whether it's news or current affairs. And I'm afraid Ofcom would have done better to be a lot more honest about that. Let me turn that specific chart briefly, I'm afraid, for your answer. No, no, no. He is saying, effectively, there's been a concerted attempt to change the interpretation of the policy. Has there been? No. I, sorry, with due respect to Stuart, and I have a huge amount right. of respect I can promise you one more question, then I'm going to have to close. Sorry. Lady Gow. Hi, thank you. Um, I want us to gloss over the dangers of undue impartiality. Um, there was a, the question about whether people were seeing self-censorship or not, and I was surprised to sort of hear that so kind of like easily dismissed. Because anyway, my name is Jess Search. I run Doc Society. I was um, for a while a Channel 4 commissioning editor and had to um, be on that side of the table. I now work with independent documentary filmmakers all over the world. Um, kind of Emmy, Oscar winning kind of work. We, um, we had a recent experience where a film was pulled off the BBC with a day to go after a complaint from the St. Helena government um, whose governor is appointed by the Foreign Office. And we were put through uh, a fact check and, and you know, editorial policy process. But what was fascinating to me is that the, the correspondence between us and, and the BBC, it, it's clear that impartiality is being applied not only between programmes, which was always traditionally when I was a commissioning editor how we thought about things, not only within programmes but within sections of programmes. And we are effectively regulated as if it were a news programme. And this will lead to a flattening of the kinds of films that can be on the BBC if anything, if everything is sort of expected to, one person says this, someone else says that. That is a, that is a, a particular style of filmmaking which we're of course used to and has its place. But if that's going to be applied universally. There is a whole range of lived experiences, voices and perspectives which will not be able to be on the BBC. Comments? Thank you very much. And I do apologise not being able to follow up more of your questions. We've slightly overrun. Uh, apologies to everybody about this. I, if I can say that there's a very good background paper done by the VLV itself on this by Sophie Chalk. I hope that will be made more available. But can I just conclude by asking our two representatives here of, I'm not sure what your representative of, sorry, I shouldn't call you representatives. Um, two questions here. In the end, does it, do we need a legal change here, or do you think that if Ofcom was more rigorous in your view, a lot of the problems we've talked about would go away? Is this the implementation 
the problem of the act itself. Sue. I'm absolutely Sue. clear that in the implementation, I think Stuart's absolutely right, and and I, I appreciate you know, of course, uh, Adam's in a difficult position, but there's clearly been a change of mind, and in my view, it's um, it's actually less to do with fears about a legal challenge, because I think the le any legal challenge will be met with the Coms three. Comes 03 impartiality requirements. It's about the political atmosphere. And Kevin Backhurst, bless him, took me to task at, I think it was a previous VRV conference, when I said that Ofcom kind of inhales the political environment. He said the only thing we inhale is the spirit of independence, but I'm afraid that's not true. Ofcom is affected by the political atmosphere. I think that's changing, and I hope Ofcom will change with it. Sue, is that your analysis as well? I agree with Steve and I agree with Stuart. Um, and the only other thing I'd like to say is that we're going to have an election to cover in the next well, 12 yeah. to 15 months. And uh, I really think that some of these issues have to be addressed before then. The idea for me that two politicians uh, can interview a senior cabinet minister of the same party, and you can call that anything like impartial, is just for the birds. Sorry. No, no, no. So, I think I'm going to have to. Stop here, and again, apologise for not giving you more time to be involved. But I would also say my thanks not only to our people on my right, but also to yes, you, because absolutely. to come and defend in what you knew was going to be difficult circumstances is entirely admirable. So thank you very much well, indeed. Okay, it's my pleasure.